Welcome to Life Point Christian Church. My name is Cameron. I'm the media director here. Hey, if you're joining us online, we're super thrilled that you chose to spend your morning here with us. We know it's summertime, and so maybe for some of you, it's even the first week that you chose to tune in. So we're grateful that you're here with us this morning tuning in. And if you're new, maybe this is your first time or one of your first few times checking out Life Point. We just want to welcome you and just thank you for choosing to spend your morning here with us. We hope that you just feel loved and encouraged as you worship with us this morning. And before we get back to our service, why don't you turn to someone around you, meet someone you may not know, and we'll get back to worshiping God in just a minute.
God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. As he opened the prison door, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Come on. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Yeah. As he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Church, let's uh, let's lift our eyes above any circumstance we might be in, any circumstance that's surrounding us, that's in our world right now, and let's turn our attention and reshift our focus to the Prince of Peace. Let's sing praise and worship Him, allowing His truth to wash over us, because our God heals, He saves, and He's still rolling stones away. Amen, church. So joy, peace, and provision in His house. There will be joy in His house, and we will experience peace. And in his house, we will have all that we need. And if there's joy in the house of the Lord, we should expect to be joyful and experience the joy of our Heavenly Father. Psalm 28, 7. Amen. It says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song, I praise him. Come on. Because yeah. we were the beggars and now we're royal. And now we're running free Cause we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace Let the house of the Lord sing praise Come on! Cause we were the beggars Now we're royalty We were the prisoners Now we're running free We are forgiven, accepted We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. We're gonna shout out. Abba, Father, we love you. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and the praise. We worship you today as one body, one voice, glorifying you, praising you, thanking you. God. May we be reminded today that we don't only have a risen king, but we have a returning king, God. 
and you have already won the battle for eternity, and you are coming back, and may we not lose focus, lose sight of that. May we continue to worship you, worship you like we know you're coming back, live our lives like we know you're coming back, God. Continue to give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. May we bow down, may we cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. God, we love you. Let every eye be fixed upon King Jesus. Let every tribe and tongue prepare the way. Let every heart be filled with expectation. The King is coming. The King is coming. So open the doors up. Come let the light in. And people get ready. Get ready to worship Him. Open the doors up. Come let the light in. People get ready. Bow down and worship Him. Singing, Holy is the Lord our God Almighty, who was and is and forever will be. Word
Amen. The King is coming back. And I got to tell you, that's a game changer, right? That's a game changer for how we live our lives. When, when we have that perspective, when we have that knowledge, when we hold that truth close to our hearts that the King is coming back, it changes the way we view life, right? It changes how we see the world around us because now we have hope, right? And now we have a reason to go on because we know we know that some, something is going to happen that the world doesn't yet know that the king is coming back. Amen? And we have reason to worship and glorify him for that truth. You all can have a seat. We're going to continue our teaching series this morning called Afterlife. We're going to wrap that up. And uh, before we do, though, I want to make you aware of some things that are happening at LifePoint so that you are in the no. First, for those of you who are, are brand new, maybe this is your very first time here or you've been coming for just a little while now. We're so glad that you've joined us. At some point during our time together, we would encourage you to take a moment and fill out our connection card. There's two different ways you can go about doing that. You can do it through a, a hard copy of pulling a card from the seat back pocket in front of you and, and filling that out. Or you can do it digitally by texting the word connecting, I-N-G on the end of that, connecting to 94000. Either way, though, we would love for you to stop out at the Connection Hub in, in the lobby right after the service. We have a gift for you there. Just as a way to say thanks for spending some of your time with us this morning. You know, there's so many different ways to get involved at LifePoint to serve and, and be a part of what's happening here. One of those ways is by joining one of the teams that Pastor Trevor leads, our, our tech team. This team serves behind the scenes faithfully. Uh, you might not notice what they do, but they are a uh, valuable, just a vital role for making services happen here on a Sunday morning and for those who participate with us online. And so you don't need to have production experience to be a part of this team. Uh, basic computer skills would be the only prereq that you would have to have coming in. But man, they'll get you trained up. It's just such a vital component. You'll see uh, some pictures on the screen of that team working behind the scenes on Sundays. And so if that peak your interest, explore that. I would encourage you to kind of press into that. Shoot Pastor Trevor an email. You can kind of talk through what that might look like for you to join that particular team. We'd love to have you as part of the tech team. Also, I want to ask you a question. Have you stopped recently to work on it? To work on it. You might be wondering, well, what does that mean? You see, so much of our time we, we spend in it, in the grind, in the routine, going from day to day, week to week, grinding it out, right? But there's so much value when we take time to step back, evaluate, pause, and work on it. And the Global Leadership Summit, a two-day conference that we're going to be hosting here, is that opportunity to stop, pause, improve, grow, and work on it so that we are better when we're in it, that we're a better friend, that we're a better parent, that we're a better boss, that we're a better employee, a coach, a student, whatever the case may be, whatever role you play when you are in it. We would love for you to join us at this two-day event so that we can improve and be better as Christ followers and in every other role that we have. Also, this year, there's a couple of different ticket options. And so it's a two-day conference, and you can attend for $120. But if you can't pull that off, whether it's time from work or you're just looking to kind of uh, decrease expenses these days, we have a one-day ticket option as well for Thursday or Friday for only 60 bucks. We would love for you to come out, though, and be a part of that. A couple of other things to be aware of. If you are a student or faculty member, if you are a nurse, uh, if you are in active military, you can come for both days for only $99. So be aware of that perk. Also, if you are a nurse, if you work in HR, or if you are an ACSI, I think I got that right, ACSI teacher, you can get continuing education credits for attending the summit. And so all of those details and to register are online. Go to lifepoint.org slash GLS, and we, we would love to have you work on it with us. You know, for those of you who would say, yeah, I'm, I'm a LifePoint member, this is, this is my church home, we want to give you the opportunity to continue in your worship through giving as well. The offering is a way for us to respond in faith through our generosity to all that God is doing in our lives. So we have the opportunity to do that together this morning. We you mind to pray for us as we continue our teaching series? We'll ask the Lord to be our teacher this morning. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that uh, you are coming back, that you are sending your son and he is coming back. And 
and what that does for the way we live our lives here and now as we look forward to eternity with you. God, I pray that as we continue our teaching series this morning, that, that you would be our teacher, God, that you would help us to grab hold of all the truth that you want us to know and understand, and that we would be able to apply it to our lives. And we pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Great to have you with us today. If you're online, we're thrilled to have you part of the service as well as we get ready to wrap up this series, Afterlife, we've been in. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've been praising God these last few days at the mom- m- um, just monumental decision made by the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade. Is that something to praise God about? Man. Something I just, I mean, I never thought I would see that in my lifetime. And so praise God for that. After decades of people praying and, and just putting their attention towards trying to help those who don't have a voice, uh, the unborn children who, who are voiceless. And, and so praise God they made that decision. And that's something we want to continue to be in prayer over even moving forward. Because, you know, we live in a democracy. And what this decision did, if you followed or paid attention, all it really did is return to what it was prior to Roe v. Wade, which is put the decision back in the hands of the states. In other words, put it in the decision back in the hands of the people who make the decisions based on their votes. And so now more than ever, is it's time for you and I to have our vo- vote and our voice be heard, to maybe it's a step in even more and to be praying even more. For example, here in California, uh, um, you know, we're one of the most, uh, uh, we, abortion rights are something that, that's, you know, the biggest in the country, so to speak. And uh, uh, we now have a bill that's been going on prior to this decision that's been in the assembly and the politicians are seeking to pass it. It's called AB2223. And it is horrific. I would really encourage you to check it out. It's a, they want to expand here in California, expand abortion rights in a terrible way. So again, this is a time to be praying more than ever. God answers prayer. To be praying, to step in and let your vote and your voice be heard. You can even step into that, research it, and there's a lot of ways you can uh, get involved. We, we don't want to see that come about. But this also makes me think about uh, what the Bible says about Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus was full of two things. He was full of grace. Maybe you know the passage. He was full of grace and what? Grace and? Grace and truth, right? Grace and truth. And so I think about that, and, and we absolutely know abortion is wrong, but we also know that the topic is incredibly painful and difficult to many, many people. And so I hope and I pray that those of us here at LifePoint, that we are people who will be full of compassion and love. Okay, that's the grace component, as we stand for truth. So stand for truth, yes, but also live by grace and be full of compassion and love towards other people who right now, they might not see the way you see, and they might be angry, and they might be uh, frustrated and hurt, and, and so as that's going on with some people, keep that in mind, that you be a person, stand for truth, but live by grace. Is that something we can all jump on board with? Amen? All right, let's uh, pray and then uh, dive in. Heavenly Father, I'm so excited about our message today. Uh, God, there's a lot of questions we have, and I pray you'd speak uh, to us to this morning that we can hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so today is the last message uh, of our series, Afterlife. And, and, and we've discovered that, man, one minute after you die, you are going to discover that that is going to be an incredible moment. You're going to be filled uh, with joy if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior because you will be in the presence of Almighty God enjoying eternity in heaven. But for those who don't, one minute after they die, one minute after that, it's going to be horrific and horrendous. And they're going to be in a position going, oh my goodness, I didn't make the right decision. And now they're facing eternity separated from God in torment. We're talking about this topic for a couple of reasons. One, because there's actually a lot of misunderstanding, misinformation 
about the afterlife, what happens after this life, and even in Christian circles. But secondly, the main reason we're talking about this is because what you believe and know about eternity affects and impacts the way you live today. What you believe about eternity impacts the decisions that you make today. So today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to wrap up the series by, I'm going to answer a bunch of common questions that, that people have. Today's really a, a Q&A time, and, and, and so we're going to answer some questions. Now, uh, you get to ask the questions. Well, actually, you don't get to ask them out loud. I already asked them for you, so I already have the questions, but uh, we're going to look at these. So today, if you're visiting, today's like a, a, a totally different. It's just it's a Q&A. We only have a couple minutes for each question. If you want to dive in deeper, which I would encourage you to do, Go study the scripture further and get a more robust answer. But today, it's different because we're running through a bunch of questions and, and, and answers. So uh, before we dive in deeper, a little disclaimer here. Um, first of all, as we look at these questions, we absolutely believe here that the Bible is God's word. It's the authoritative wor- uh, word of God for us. And so that's where we will turn first, foremost, and primary, as is always the case today and every week. And so where the Bible speaks, we're going we're gonna to show you what the Bible says. If the Bible isn't super clear, what we're going to try to do is grab a hold of some principles that we see in Scripture. And then third, if, we, if that's not clear enough for us, then I'll just say, hey, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm guessing here, but here's kind of an opinion. And so, and I would even encourage you to approach that as you look at any topic in your life, that that's your, that's your go-to. First and foremost, what does God's Word say? Is it clear on the topic? If it's not clear, are there principles in Scripture? And if that's not clear, then be real clear that, man, it's your opinion, and you're just taking a stab at it. All right, with that said, let's dive into uh, one of the most controversial questions to kick it all off. Many people want to know, do my pets go to heaven? Do my pets go to heaven? A couple weeks ago, uh, on June 8th, it was National Best Friends Day. And I was watching this uh, 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 article, or I was watching this news show, and, and they, they put a survey up uh, of Americans. And the survey said, of those surveyed, 19% of Americans say that their dog is their best friend. And 9% of Americans say that their cat is their best friend. Man, when I heard that, that was disturbing to me. And I know that sounds funny, and I probably the way I set that up. Um, but it's disturbing. In, in a serious note, it's disturbing. It's a little bit sad to me because that means that 28% of Americans, their best friend is an animal and not a human being. And that's concerning. So I actually understand that this topic, for some people, is a big deal. Do pets go to heaven? And that reminds me, as we dive into these questions today, some of the questions are going to seem silly to you, but not to others. And some of the questions, you're going to be like, actually, I'm really curious about that. So be mindful. Or even people you know, you're like, well, it's a silly question, but for somebody you know, it's an important question. 28% of Americans, this is an important question for them. Do our pets go to heaven? Well, it depends on what pets. Pets. It depends on what pets, because we're talking cats, definitely they're not going to heaven. God's not having cats wander around. (laughs) The reality is, the Bible doesn't tell us whether or not our pets go to heaven. But let me ask you to consider a couple questions. If you're one who thinks, well, my pets are going to go to heaven, I'm just curious, what's your criteria by which they get to heaven? Who makes that decision? If there's a heaven for pets, does that mean there's a hell for pets? Since they obviously don't believe in Jesus, do the good ones go to heaven, but the bad ones go to hell? If my dog never pees in the house, does that go to heaven? But if my dog always pees in the house, does that, you know, what happens there? Or what about this? Do uh, Christian owners of pets, do their dogs go to heaven, but non-Christian owners, do their... You see where I'm kind of going with some of the questions? Here's what we know. We know that God created you and I, humanity, in his own image. And that God breathed spiritual life into you and I. But as far as we can tell from Scripture, God did not create animals in his own image. And we don't see in Scripture anywhere that God breathed spiritual life into animals. Next, we know, according to Romans chapter 10, that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. And yet, we don't see animals calling on the name of Jesus. As we look through Scripture, we see that Jesus died for people, 
Nowhere do we see that Jesus died for our pets. I do think it's interesting. There are some passages that mention animals in heaven. I think about Isaiah chapter 11 that prophesied and said, In that day, the wolf and the, the, wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion, and the little child will lead them. Revelation chapter 19 shows us and tells us that Jesus, when he returns, will return himself and his heavenly armies, all riding on white horses. Sadly, as far as I can tell, I don't see any evidence that heaven will have our pets. I hope that doesn't mean that 28% of our church won't be here next week, but that's what we can tell. Next question. A lot of people actually wonder, can a Christian be cremated? In ancient times, pagans would cremate the bodies of their, dead, of their loved dead ones. That was why Israelites and later Christians, they didn't want to be like pagan and participate in pagan activity, and so they would bury their bodies. I've always told Heather, I do not want to be cremated. How am I going to be resurrected in the last days? And so for 30 years, I, I carried on with this. And, and, and she would just like, she would always wonder, because, you know, I joke around a lot. And she was like, I mean, are you serious? And so I, I kept going at this for 30 years and, and, and holding out on her on this and not telling her what, what I thought. And, and I'm like, no, no, you know, you don't cremate me. But as we got closer, you know, I'm now getting older. I'm like, I guess I should tell her the truth. And, and so kind of told her that recently. But the real question becomes, can God restore a cremated body at the resurrection? Well, what do we know? We know, we know Christian martyrs have died at the stake and have been burned to the point of dust and ashes. We know that somebody, a Christian in war, People in war can be uh, destroyed uh, um, and even obliterated their bodies by bombs. And of course, buried bodies decompose, as Genesis chapter 3 says, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So the question of burial or cremation, whether, whether, by, whether by burial you return to dust or whether you return to dust by cremation, it seems to me as we look at Scripture, it's all within the realm of Christian freedom. But what do we know? Here's what we know. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it tells us we're not just spirits, but that God will resurrect us and that you and I will have glorified bodies. That's what the scripture talks about. We'll have glorified bodies just like Jesus had after his resurrection. Remember, he said to his disciples in Luke chapter 24 when he went before him, he said, hey, look, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself Touch me and see, because a spirit does not have flesh and blood, as you plainly see that I have. A day will come when Christians will have resurrected, glorified bodies, and God's going to give that to us whether we're buried or cremated. Now, here's another question that some people have. Are we going to be married or have sex in heaven? And, and as much as I would love to be married to Heather, Heather for all eternity, we just celebrated 30 of those years a couple weeks ago together. Praise God. As much as I'd love to be with her for all eternity, Scripture says something different. It tells us in Matthew chapter 22, verse 30, it says, At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And of course, practically, so let's just think about this practically speaking. I mean, you get up to heaven, it's going to be pretty complicated if you had multiple marriages for whatever reason, right? I mean, are you going to be able to choose, oh, I'll take that one, but not that one? I mean, come on, right? That's not going to happen. God knew the nightmare that would create. So he's like, I'm going a different route. Though we won't be married in heaven, Scripture indicates that there will be some familiarity that there will be some recognition. And so for the record, God, I'm putting in now, I want to you know, have Heather be a roommate or at least a next-door neighbor. So go on that route. Well, will we have sex in heaven? Well, since there's no marriage in heaven, and since God created sex to happen only and solely in the context of marriage, I think it's safe to assume there isn't going to be uh, sex in heaven. Sorry, everybody. Just the way it is. All right, next question that I think some people get curious about. Actually, a lot of people do. Can we or should we try to contact the dead? 
Can we or should we be trying to contact those in heaven? It reminds me of a song from a movie. Uh, Who are you going to call when you're all alone? Pick up the phone and call? Ghostbusters. Can we or should we try to contact the dead? This question actually includes a whole bunch of subcategories and sub-questions. What about seances? What about Ouija boards? Maybe you did that as a kid. Is that innocent enough or not? Is it dangerous? Witchcraft is popular today. Is it okay to read the little books or cast spells? Is that all just, you know, innocent fun? What about somebody reading your palms or calling up a number to pay $10 a minute to have Mademoiselle tell you, you know, where you lost your whatever? Is that all innocent, harmless, or is it dangerous? God was clear about this. And he told the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 18, he said this. He said, when you enter the land the Lord your God has given you, be very careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. What were those? Verse 10. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a bird offering. And do not let people practice fortune telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits from the dead. Anyone, everybody say anyone. Anyone who does these things is detestable. Everybody say detestable. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. You see, God says these aren't cute. These aren't innocent. They're incredibly dangerous. And so God says something, God says this is something we are never, ever to do, to participate in, to be involved in, in any way, shape, or form. But the question is why? Why does God tell you and I to stay away from all of this? Well, who are the mediums and the sorcerers and the spiritists and all these people? Who are they talking to when they're reaching out? Who are, who are they reaching out to? Are they really talking to your dead uncle? The answer is an emphatic no, they aren't. Scripture tells us something very interesting in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It says that Satan distinguishes himself as an angel of light. You ever hear people talk about death or talk about we've had experiences and they always talk about what what do they always say they saw the light there was a light at the end of the tunnel oh it was so bright scripture makes it clear there's demonic spirits masquerading and pretending to be angels of light and they use deception and they use trickery and and they'll even talk about love And they'll even talk about the value of religion. And maybe even they'll talk about Jesus in a positive way. They'll impersonate the dead. Their goal is to confuse, to deceive, and to ultimately lead us in the wrong direction and to give us a false sense of security. Hey, we're all good. Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah warned that consulting a medium or reaching out to anyone who tries to make contact with the dead Isaiah said, man, you're turning your back on God. You see, trying to consult the dead in any way, shape, or form, all we're doing is inviting evil spirits into our lives who are pretending to be angels of light. Along these lines, what about near-death experiences? Are they real? Can you die and actually come back to life? Well, I can tell you this, this is a hard to know a matter of fact answer from Scripture. It just is. What we do know, uh, different things in Scripture, we know, for example, that before Stephen, who was a Jesus follower, before he died, uh, Acts chapter 7 tells us that he got a glimpse into heaven and he saw the throne room of God. It was unique because it happened right before literally he died. The Apostle Paul had a similar experience when he was caught up in in paradise, it says, in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, chapter 12. And some scholars say that that event that happened to Paul where he's caught up in paradise, that was what happened to Paul in Acts chapter 14. Some scholars will say that in, in, in Acts chapter 14, Paul was in the city of Lystra, and they didn't like what he was talking about. And so the city people took, the people of the city took him outside the city. They grabbed stones. They threw them at him to try to kill him. And the Bible says he was presumed and left for dead. 
And so some scholars say that that time, that moment when, was when Paul was caught up in paradise. And so while we can maybe leave room for us to have similar experiences, the problem is this, is that near-death experiences may or may not reflect the true condition of life beyond the grave. And so those, man, they have to be carefully evaluated against Scripture and what the Bible says about the afterlife. And oftentimes those stories, those circumstances, those books people write are not consistent with what Scripture says. Here's what we do know. The devil, his demonic spirits, of course they're going to try to duplicate similar experiences that, that Paul and Stephen had with those who aren't believers. Why is he, is he and are they going to do that? Well, he's the great deceiver. The Scripture says he's the great liar. And he wants people to think and believe that beauty and bliss and love and light awaits them, awaits everybody, regardless of what you think about Jesus. He wants people to have a false confidence that they're all good. Again, if somebody claims to see a light or to see the light, just remember, Scripture is clear that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Okay, let's talk about a, a really tough question for a moment. Can a person who commits suicide go to heaven? According to the CDC, uh, in 2020, 1.2 million Americans attempted suicide. And according to the CDC website, the leading cause of death in the United States in 2020 with 45,979 deaths, people who took their own lives that year. I don't know about you, but that's staggering to me. To think that, that every 11 seconds that, that there's somebody who is in so much pain and there's so much hopelessness that they feel that the only answer is to take their life. It's heartbreaking. Looking to Scripture, we see seven examples of people who took their own life. A few of those, like Abimelech, in, in Judges chapter 9, he asked his armor bearer to kill him. Saul fell on his own sword. And then you might know the story of Samson. Samson, uh, when God restored his strength one last time, he, uh, he pushed the pillars down of the building he was in, killing all the enemy that was in the building, the Philistines, and in the process, thus taking his own life. Can someone who does such a thing spend eternity in heaven? Now, i got to tell you, we don't get a, a direct answer in the Bible, but there are principles we can seek to apply. What do we know? We know that murder is a sin. Taking your own life is murder, so therefore it's a sin. But nowhere in Scripture do we see it being the unpardonable or unforgivable sin. Matthew chapter 12 tells us that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that's the unpardonable sin. And some commentators will say that only applied back when Jesus said that. How would you interpret that today or how would you describe it today? Well, the only unforgivable sin is refusing to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior on this side of eternity. Suicide's a sin. It's incredibly foolish, but I want you to hear this. For you, maybe somebody here, or somebody you know, it's never, ever, ever the answer. It's never the answer. If you're dealing with this in your life right now, man, I beg you, I plead with you, talk to somebody. Talk to me, talk to a staff member, talk to one of our prayer team members at the end of the service. I beg you, talk to somebody. There is hope for you. Suicide's never, it's never the answer. So please reach out if you find yourself in that circumstance or that situation. There's a subcategory of people who uh, would take their own life, and they might be called heroes. I think about somebody who maybe during a, a, a soldier would jump on a grenade or, 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 a, or a, a, you know, a mine or something to save the life of his or her uh, fellow soldiers. Maybe a parent sees their kid running the street, sees car coming and runs out and 
pushes their kid out of the way to save their life, and in doing so, their life is taken. People would say, man, they're, they're heroes. They might even quote Jesus when Jesus said in John 15, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Let's keep in mind what Romans chapter 8 says. It says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. It doesn't say there's no condemnation except in these instances. So while suicide is incredibly foolish and it's a sin, Scripture does not indicate that it's not forgivable by God. Next question. When you and I are in heaven, will we remember our lives on earth? I don't know about you, but there is definitely some parts of my life I don't ever want to remember. And there's parts that I don't want anybody else to ever remember. Do I hear an amen? But I know there's some parts that, man, I hope I never forget. Will we be able to remember our lives on earth? Now, the Bible doesn't speak directly to this, but there's different verses that seem to support different viewpoints, in fact. For example, some say uh, we won't remember based on Isaiah chapter 65, which says, uh, God says, behold, I'm going to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Of course, my question is, to that person who would make that argument is, what are the former things? Are the former things, does that include everything or maybe just some things? Those who say, yes, we will remember our lives on earth, they're going to point to Luke chapter 19 as one of the verses and one of the passages. You might remember that story. We talked about it a couple weeks ago when, when Jesus told the story about a rich guy who had died and was in torment in Hades. And he was in this place of torment, and he distinctly remembered his brothers on earth. And he distinctly remembered that the way they, they had been living their lives, if they continued to live that way, if they didn't get right with God, well, then they would end up where he was, and he didn't want that to be the case for them. People also argue the point to say we'll remember, and they'll point to the judgment seat of Christ. We talk about that in week one. In the judgment seat of Christ, you and I as Christ followers, we are going to be judged. We're not going to be judged about, uh, about salvation because Jesus saves us. We're going to be judged based on our works and receive rewards as a result of that. And so the logic goes, well, if we're going to remember those works, that means surely we remember some parts of our life. Revelation chapter 1 says that one day God will wipe away all the tears from, those, from the eyes of those who are in heaven, perhaps implying that there might be some memory of our life on earth. My biblical guess is that, yeah, we're going to remember some of our life here on earth, perhaps all of it with a new perspective. Here's another big one. Can those who died and who are now in heaven, can they see what's going on here on earth? Can grandma see what's happening right now? Is she watching down? Is she looking out for us? Those who say yes, they're going to point to Hebrews chapter 12, which says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and they will reason, well, we're surrounded by these witnesses, so obviously they're witnesses and they're seeing what's going on. Others will say, uh, will say, well, that just means that they're witnesses to the goodness and to the glory and the majesty and the splendor of God. Hebrews chapter 12 isn't clear one way or the other. There's no clear indication that these witnesses are witnesses to what's happening here on earth, at least from that passage. Those who don't think we will be able to remember or be able to see what's happening on earth, they will also point back to that story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. And they'll say, okay, Lazarus, he, he knew and remembered his brothers and remembered what their life was like, but nothing in the passage shows us that he was actually seeing what was happening in their life. There's nothing, to, for me at least, in Scripture to convince me that believers in heaven are actually seeing what's happening here on earth. Now, the last and most important question of, of, this, of today and of this series that we've been in, is there more than one way to get to heaven? Is there more than one way to get to heaven? Religious pluralism dominates our culture and society today. What is that? Religious pluralism is basically the belief that all religions, all faith-based roads lead to God. 
that most people, if you're spiritual, if you're sincere, if you're a good person, you will get to heaven. But you need to know, Jesus didn't give us that option. Jesus was clear in John chapter 14, he said this. He said, I am away and I am, oh my bad. What do you say? I am what? The way, the truth, the life. And nobody gets to the Father except through me. The Apostle Peter in one of his early sermons stood up in Acts chapter 4 and he said, salvation is found in no one else. He's talking about Jesus. For there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Most people believe that all roads will lead to God, will lead to heaven. Here's what's, what's so alarming to me. A survey was done of evangelical Christians. And the survey came up with the results that 57% of evangelical Christians, that would be kind of like people like us, 57% of them said that there are multiple roads that can lead to eternal life. Man, if that's true, that means that over half the people in this room possibly believe that you can get to heaven other than through Jesus. And I hope and pray that's not the case for us here. Jesus is the only one who can save us. He is the only way in which we can be ushered into eternity. The question is, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Because what you believe, what you believe about Jesus, what you believe about eternity, will determine the choices and the decisions that you make right here today. And the most important decision you can make literally right now is to receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus if you haven't already done so. To take that step right now. And I want to give you that chance as we wrap this up so that one minute after you die, you'll be elated knowing that you are standing, you've been ushered in to the presence of Almighty God. You don't want to be in a position one minute after you die where you find yourself standing there in shock and horror going, what did I do or not do before I died? Scripture is clear. Is it appointed unto man once to die and then face judgment? You don't know when that day is. Don't wait. Today is the day of salvation. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to do that right now. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. It's not even the exact words, but it's more that, yeah, you're going to mean it in your heart. In fact, I'm going to invite everybody to pray this. And if you're a Christ follower, you're going to pray this, you know, for the 10th time, the 20th time, the 100th time. And we're going to do that together. But some of you are going to do it for the first time. And God's going to come into your life. And he's going to save you. And you're going to join the family of God. And you'll be forgiven of your sin. And you will receive the hope of heaven. So that one minute after you die, you will be standing there in front of God and enjoying eternity with your heavenly Father. Will you receive that? Will you receive that? We receive the love of Jesus now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come before you now with grateful hearts. God, hearts that are so full, knowing, God, that you loved us so much that you died so that we could live. Thank you, Jesus, for paving the way, for being the, the way, the truth, and the life. And God, right now, would you hear our prayers, these prayers of faith? So I invite you all to pray with me now. Just say something like this. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you would choose to die as a sacrifice for my sins, to die in my place so that I could spend eternity with my heavenly Father. And so, Jesus, right now, I surrender my life to you. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I'm choosing to no longer live for myself, but to live for you. And I thank you, God, for welcoming me into your family, the family of God. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. What we're going to do right now is we're going to invite you to take this one step further, all of us, and enter into a time of communion. What is that? Well, first of all, let me have the ushers come down the aisle. If you did not get a cup on the way in and, and a wafer on the way in, slip of your hand, they'll put it in your hands. You can begin to open those. What is this? Well, Jesus said 
he was with his disciples the night before he, uh, he was betrayed, or the night he was betrayed, and he told them, he said, hey, I want you to take this bread and eat it because it represents my body. They didn't understand what it meant at the time, but you and I know. He said, I want you to take this wine, or in our case, juice, and I want you to drink this. This is my blood, the blood of a new covenant. They didn't understand at that moment, you and I know now, that Jesus was going to die on a cross so that we could live. His blood was shed on a cross, covered our sins so that we can be pure before God. And so I want to invite you right now, in this moment when you're ready, you have this moment with God, celebrating that you're His, that He is your beloved, and He's for you. And as you take this and you're grateful to God for this, when you're ready, join with the worship team and lift up your, your, your voice in song and praise God through your voice. God doesn't need our praise because he has amnesia, okay? We need it to be reminded of who he is and what he does in our life. So let's lift up our voices to him as we celebrate the goodness and the love of God. This is 
Thank you guys so much for joining us, worshiping together as one body this morning. Before you get out of here, we want to be a church that prays for each other and with each other. We have our prayer team on both sides of the stage here. Come on up. We all need prayer, so come on up. We want to pray for you. Also, on your way out, we not only want to be a church that prays with and for each other, but we want to be a church that actually knows one another. So on your way out, turn to someone you don't know. Introduce yourself. Ask them this question. We'll see you guys next time. God bless.